perhaps sort of an intro to what will be the next 10 classes. Uh, we will not uh, stick rigidly to that. Uh, uh, let me see uh, first if I can get the uh, PowerPoint started. Uh, th this class will establish for us a paradigm or a, a strategic approach to progressive revelation and uh, the very specific uh, aspects of progressive revelation. And we're going to examine them uh, first tonight, just the various uh, patterns that we're going to look for in each religion. And then the next 10 classes, we'll spend two classes on Judaism, two on Christianity, two on uh, Islam and two on the Babi faith and two on the Baha'i faith. We're not going to study them in any complete way, obviously, in two hours per religion, we couldn't possibly do that. So what we're establishing tonight or what we're going to look for as we go through those, and I'm going to give you uh, some, uh, a couple of slides at the end of my presentation to show you how to prepare for next class on uh, Judaism. Uh, so uh, our overlay or paradigm for our study of the Abrahamic religions uh, is going to consist of, first of all, the various levels of covenant evident uh, in each religion, particularly the level of covenant dealing with succession, which is called the lesser covenant in Baha'i terminology. We're going to look at the authenticity of access to the revelation itself. In other words, are the texts, the scriptures of the religion authentic? Uh, are, are the, do the, uh, they uh, pass down from generation to generation. How the manifestation complies with the proofs, powers, and perfections outlined in the Book of Certitude. Uh, there are approximately six proofs, uh, really, uh, yeah, six uh, proofs more or less in the Book of Certitude, specific guidelines uh, which Baha'u'llah uses to prove the authenticity of the Bab, but he says in that that they uh, will apply to any manifestation, the same criteria. The explicit and implicit connections to the previous and succeeding dispensations, uh, and that would be the prophecies, uh, the covenant, uh, and so on. What uh, uh, connections do we see uh, leading to that religion uh, as a proof, and uh, how does that religion set up uh, for its followers uh, cautions about how to identify the next prophet in the next religion? How the study of the religion informs or confirms and is informed by the Baha'i teachings and texts. In other words, what special things do we discover about the religion in the Baha'i text that we didn't know before or that is really stated nowhere else? And we'll sample a few of those tonight so I can show you what I mean. Miracles. Uh, miracles are dwelt on so uh, importantly uh, by believers in most religions uh, so we're going to take a look at the, what they're about tonight uh, because we're going to find, as Abu Baha says, that their outer meaning really doesn't have that much significance, but their inner meaning does. And so uh, we'll give you some samples of how that works. The foundational theology of the religion in light of Baha'i teachings and texts. And here's again, progressive revelation. What does a religion believe about uh, the nature of God? The nature of theodicy, which means how do you justify evil existing in a universe presumably created by a perfect God? And so therefore it must be a perfect universe. And so how do you account for what seem to be injustice and imperfections? The concept of heaven, the concept of hell, the concept of eschatology, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Eschatology meaning the end times. What is the, the religion's view of uh, the end result of everything that uh, we're going through historically? So we're going to focus, as, uh, as we've said before, on the five dispensations of the Abrahamic religion, 
Judaism, whose prophet is Moses, and whose scripture, at least the scripture supposedly written by Moses, the Pentateuch. Christianity, and of course Christianity, Christ is the Messiah, viewed as the Messiah, and uh, the Gospels, uh, the, particularly the four Gospels and the whole of the New Testament are uh, dealing with both the words of Christ and commentaries on the words of Christ by the letters to the various churches and the Acts of the Apostles and so on. Islam, of course, the prophet is Muhammad and the work, uh, the pr principal work is the Quran, though the Hadith, some of them are, uh, are, are, are authenticated. And so we will look at some of those, particularly when we get to the Quran, for reasons that become very important in the history of Islam. The Babi faith, of course, the manifestation is the Bab, and his principal uh, uh, two works are the Kayyum al Asma, the best of stories, and the Bayan, though he wrote many other works as well. Then the Baha'i faith, the two principal works are the doctrinal work of Baha'u'llah, which is the Book of Certitude, and the Most Holy Book. Uh, it thought, this is kind of interesting, just toss this in, is uh, something to observe about the uh, nature of progressive revelation. And that is, on the one hand, as Baha'is, we believe that uh, this is all one process, that the, the religions on planet Earth are really one religion revealed in various cycles and dispensations, uh, and that there's a continuity there. And one of, and yet at the same time, each time uh, a manifestation appears with a religion, uh, the world is recreated. And one sign of that, how seriously we take that, whether we understand it or not, is that we have a, um, we start time all over again with each succeeding religion. So this is the year 5780. Uh, and that's BCE, which used to be before Christ, but now BCE is the uh, uh, non-religious designation of before the common era. Uh, the Christian calendar, of course, begins at zero in the common era with the birth of Christ, though the birth of Christ is now disputed done not to be zero, but that's beside the point. We still call this 2020 since the birth of Christ. The Islamic calendar uh, is 1442 AH, which means after the Hijira, when Muhammad went from Mecca to Medina, uh, and it begins in 622 uh, in the common era. The Baha'i calendar, it's the year 177 BE, the Baha'i era, uh, which began in 1844 of the Common Era. So I, I think that's kind of interesting that even though these are continuous outpourings of the same thing, uh, time begins all over again. So we, we come to this question, if it is God's plan, this plan of successive revelations or progressive revelation, and God is perfect, then his plan should be perfect. So why doesn't it work? Well, the short answer is it does, and it will. But in the midst of what we're in right now, it doesn't seem like it. And if you look at history, it doesn't seem like it has in the past. Uh, one interesting quote in that regard is what the uh, Guardian says that the Bob alludes to in the Bayan. He says, in the, this is a quote from Shoghi Effendi, in the Bayan, the Bob says that every religion was meant to be universal and also deserved to become so. The only reason why they have all failed to stand up to that mark was due to the inability of the followers who were entrusted, that should be were, not where, with that task. Let us endeavor lest we also fail to realize that ideal which Baha'u'llah has set before us. Uh, we're going to deal with this later so when we get to the Babi faith, so I'm not going to go into it now. 
Suffice it to say that universal does not mean in this instance, as Abdu'l Baha explains, worldwide, because really it's only with Islam that you had the feasibility that a religion could have spread worldwide because of technical development uh, in society and uh, civilization. Uh, the plan of God at every level. Uh, now here we're talking about <clears throat> the overall plan of God, which is called the eternal covenant, which is the agreement between God and humankind on planet earth that he'll never leave us without sufficient guidance conveyed through a manifestation. They may be in different cycles, they may come in different eras within that cycle, but we will never be without guidance. Then you have a subsidiary covenant to that, which is called the greater covenant. The greater covenant, which every manifestation of God makes with his followers, promising that in the fullness of time, a new manifestation will be sent and taking from them the understanding to accept him when this occurs. Uh, and uh, we'll again deal with this in every one of these religions. Then finally, the lesser covenant, there is also the lesser covenant that a manifestation of God makes with his followers that they will accept his appointed successor after him. If they do so, the faith can remain united and pure. If not, the faith becomes divided and its force spent. And what we're going to defi find out is of these, among these five religions, which uh, manifestations of successfully appointed an institution and a successor. You're going to find some surprises, or at least they surprised me when I studied it. Each time we have a new outpouring or a new revelation, we have what's called uh, by Baha'u'llah a renewal of the city of certitude, or in the New Testament it's called the New Jerusalem, but it doesn't mean a literal city. Uh, and here is the quote uh, that uh, unveils what that means. And you can see I put in yellow, that city is none other than the word of God revealed in every age and dispensation. In Moses, in the day of Moses, is it was the Pentateuch. In the days of Jesus, the gospel. In the days of Muhammad, the Quran in, the day, in this day. Now this day, he's speaking in the present tense, which was 1862 when he revealed the Book of Certitude. He hadn't yet identified himself as the promised one of the Babi faith. So he says, in this day, the Bayan, and in the dispensation of him whom God will manifest his own book. And of course, he later identifies himself as that one designated by the Bab as him whom God will make manifest the book unto which all books of former dispensations must needs be referred, the book which standeth among them all transcendent and supreme. So that's what the renewal of the city is. The renewal of law uh, is uh, what Abu Baha calls it. This is a continuation uh, of, uh, the, of, of the same quote, uh, from the Egon. Uh, he says, uh, in these cities, and again, the city of certitude, of belief, of confirmation, is bountifully, bountifully provided, incorruptible delights have been ordained. The food they bestow is the bread of heaven. Now, this is important because we know of the use by Christ of this uh, metaphor that he was the bread come from heaven. Uh, and that he who partakes of me, he said, will never die. Um, Baha, I mean, Abdul Baha, as I said, calls the holy city of, and here in some answered questions, he's talking about, he's interpreting the book of Revelations. Uh, and he says, what is the holy city, the new Jerusalem that John, uh, the, uh, revelator, as he's sometimes called, uh, uh, talks about in the book of Revelations, the totality of which is symbolic. Symbols, symbols, symbols. The whole thing is symbolic. 
and almost impossible to interpret unless you read some answered questions by Abdul Baha. So that's unlocking the seals of uh, of uh, the Book of Revelation, delightfully so. It's really quite amazing, and we'll get to some of those later. For example, it foretells the coming of Muhammad and Ali, his successor. It is the law of God which descends from heaven and it is called new for it is clear that the Jerusalem which is of stone and earth does not descend from heaven and that it is not renewed, but that which renewed is the law of God. <clears throat> well, the next thing we're going to look at uh, as, uh, as we look at each religion are the main attributes of the manifestations. And so let us remind ourselves of what we've already looked at, I think, in class number two, the face of God among us. What are the main attributes of all the manifestations without exception? They are flawless in their character and actions. They do not sin. They don't make mistakes. They are infallible in their revealed guidance. They are omnipotent to the extent needed, and the extent needed by them. In other words, they have the power to do whatsoever they wish. That they don't do what they wish is because they do what is, uh, they are told by God is appropriate at the time. They are omniscient at will, meaning they know whatever they need to know when they wish to know it. Uh, they are inherently knowledgeable. They do not, and one of the things Baha'u'llah repeats, particularly throughout the epistle to the son of the wolf, but really in many places, his letters to the kings and rulers in particular, says, see if I went to any school or studied under any knowledgeable scholar. You'll find that in any city that I lived in, I did not. So in effect, he's saying, where did I get my knowledge? And of course, in the Tablet of Wisdom, the law, wisdom, the law of Hikmat, he talks about how when he wishes to see a book or what's in a book, it appears before him. So he has at his disposal a, a wonderful uh, retrieval service <laughs> uh, in his mind, uh, so he doesn't even need a, a computer screen. That they are pre-existent, one of the things we looked at again in class two. They live in the world of the spirit, the realm of the spirit, prior to their becoming incarnate. Uh, and uh, that's not true of ordinary human beings. We begin when our soul associates with the body during the process of conception. They are ever watchful over their followers and their religion after their earthly mission is completed. We saw this in a quote from a couple of classes ago, uh, a, a remarkable uh, statement about uh, a Baha'u'llah made by Shoghi Effendi. And uh, that in effect, he has more power and less constraint to assist us. <coughs> Excuse me, let me take a sip. Uh, to, now that he uh, is no longer in a, a human form than he did when he was on this earth. So, proofs of the advent of the manifestation, not the manifestations themselves, but proof that one who claims to be a manifestation, which is one of the obvious uh, signs, by the way, is they say that they are. Uh, there are many, I've had to often ask the question, well, uh, how do we know that, say, Lao Tse or, uh, or Gandhi or whoever was not a manifestation? Well, one reason is that they didn't claim to be. The manifestations are very frank and straightforward about saying, I, I am a manifestation. Uh, they, they don't do it until the proper time, but they do do it. So what are the proofs? And these are all from the uh, Book of Certitude uh, by Baha'u'llah. <clears throat> he says, first of all, there are uh, is a celestial foreshadowing. Uh, of course, the star uh, that appeared uh, that the Magi followed, the, who, the Magi, of course, were Zoroastrians who were following their own prophecies, and they discovered <clears throat> the, the young Christ. Um, I forget how many years old Christ was at that time, uh, but uh, it, it, it wasn't at his birth, as we see in some of the uh, displays of the uh, 
of the birth of Christ. There are also luminary forerunners, and that, of course, would be obvious in, say, Christ. You have John the Baptist, and uh, uh, with uh, Baha'u'llah, you have the Bab. Uh, but with the Bab, you have uh, the uh, um, Sheikh Ahmad al Hasi, you have uh, Sayyid Kazim and their writings, and they foretell the coming of the Bab and Baha'u'llah the Kaim and the Kaum. The revealed word is one of the signs, and this is the most important signs of our proofs of the advent of the manifestation, that they have the capacity to reveal the word of God spontaneously, unrehearsed, unedited, and in effect, one of the challenges that Baha'u'llah uh, gives to uh, several people who challenge him is if uh, if you think you are the manifestation, let's see you reveal something. Uh, it's an, the most important proof. The heroic lives of the early followers of the manifestations, the purity of their conduct and the heroism of their sacrifice of their lives to establish the faith. The constancy of the prophet in proclaiming the faith of God in spite of all the forces arrayed against him. Uh, of course, the Bob says in his own writings that he knows he's going to be executed, but doesn't stop him. Um, and the same thing with the torturing of Baha'u'llah, of course. He has a chance to escape, but as he says, we have consent to be bound with chains, that, the, that in effect, man, humankind will be freed. And then hadith, as they're called in Islam, or prophecies, as we call them in some of the other religions, uh, which Baha'u'llah says really aren't that important because they're so liable to mistranslation or misinterpretation. But he includes them anyhow and, and actually goes to the trouble to explicate uh, three or four of them. Another tool we will use as we go through the religions uh, are the examining of the shape of the dispensation. This isn't so much a proof, it's just I find an interesting phenomenon. And that is there's sort of a bell-shaped curve to the religions. Uh, and they don't all end in corruption and darkness or need to. We know that the Baha'i faith will not. Uh, and yet we do, the Baha'u'llah does say that he worries about the test that will occur to the manifestation who comes after him. So this doesn't mean there won't be problems. I was asked last time or the time before uh, during the Q&A, does the um, manifestation, uh, uh, does there need to be a decline in the religion? Which comes first, the need for the manifestation or the manifestation? And clearly, uh, there comes a need whether you have a decline in the religion or not. And that is, even if you have the best teacher in the world in grade school, you're still going to need to go to another level of education. So we'll have another manifestation, even if we don't corrupt the religion, the manifestation is left behind. But in the past, do uh, you have the dawning of the religion, uh, where the great energy is released and the ascent as it gathers uh, believers and spreads geographically. And then you have what I call the midday splendor of the religion, where it really, uh, reaches its, uh, the climax of its influence uh, of uh, both uh, socially and spiritually. Uh, you have that in the golden age of Islam, for example. Um, and I guess you could say that you have it in Christianity when uh, Constantine uh, de declares the uh, Christian faith to be his religion and the state religion of Rome, though by that point Christianity had already become, become to a state of decline. And that's uh, the next stage. You have a decline in the purity of the religion because of a number of things. One thing that the scripture becomes perverted or taken out of context or misinterpreted. 
And then also, of course, you have the, the, the quest for power by the religious leaders, the corruption of leaders and divines, uh, which ultimately and almost always results in a schism in the religion. Uh, and so the religion uh, has different divisions. Uh, this happens in Christianity, of course, with the uh, uh, Reformation, but long before that, you had the Eastern and Western churches divide and so on. There are a lot of uh, other, b before the Catholic Church becomes the Catholic Church, there are already divisions. And in fact, you have quarrels among the apostles, the, uh, uh, the disciples uh, and the apostles uh, during the first century of Christianity. And then finally, the nighttime. And this is, of course, the time of darkness that we see discussed very often uh, symbolically in the poems and so forth. The, the dawning of the manifestation occurs in the darkness of the previous religion. The prophecy from one revelation to the next and to the long awaited day of days, most of the religions we're going to study, in fact, all of them, discuss both, they allude to both the advent of the next manifestation uh, and also to the day of days, to the coming of Baha'u'llah, which is the completion, if you will, of this whole process, the maturity of humankind on planet Earth. And so Judaism has the uh, prophecies of the coming of the Messiah and also the coming of the abomination of desolation, which is an allusion to the ordeal or the last judgment that uh, uh, will signal the coming of the golden age of Baha'u'llah or the advent of Baha'u'llah. You can interpret it several ways. Christianity, you have Christ talking about one who will succeed him, whom he calls the comforter in one place. And then <clears throat> in another place, he talks about the coming of the second coming at the time of the end. Same thing with Islam. You have the advent of the Qa'im, uh, he who is sent, uh, but also the last judgment, the day of resurrection, which uh, Islam interprets as the end of time, the end of days, uh, when the earth will be destroyed and all will, so on. There were many, uh, of course, uh, fundamental uh, Christian sects believe the same thing. The Babi faith, uh, talks about, uh, of course, the coming of him whom God will make manifest, or Mestaka uh, is the one who is sent, the second trumpet blast of Islam. Uh, and it's also called uh, both by the Bab and in the uh, Book of Surtitude, the latter resurrection. So the Bab is the resurrection talked about in Islam and the Baha'u'llah is the latter resurrection. So the Baha'i faith talks about the unity uh, uh, and fulfillment of this time, bringing humankind into a single planetary social order under the banner of a single religion and collaborative polity, a day not to be followed by night and yet not until a thousand years. And even then Baha'u'llah fears for what that one will endure or suffer. Uh, so Baha'u'llah doesn't talk about the day of days. Uh, he does uh, instead say this cycle that has begun will endure 500,000 years, though there will be many manifestations who will come in his shadow. Uh, but the important thing to remember is, as we will see later, this single planetary social order that Baha'u'llah has designed and that will come to fruition is, according to the Guardian, the furthermost limits in human social organization that you can have in a planetary system. So we must, or you, you, you don't must, but I conclude that this means any planet where this same process of progressive revelation is taking place, the same planetary structure is the final stage of development there too. Doesn't mean it's the final stage of social development altogether because uh, we may well have some interplanetary unity that will uh, supersede 
the planetary unity? Don't know. Um, why the Quran in preference to the Old Testament regarding conflicting information? Um, let me take another sip of my tea. This is a statement from Shoghi Effendi. The friend should unhesitatingly, and for reasons that are only too obvious, give precedence to the sayings of Baha'u'llah, which it would be pointed out, is fully corroborated by the Quran, which book is more authentic than the Bible, including the, both the New and Old Testaments. The Bible is not wholly authentic, and in this respect, not to be compared with the Quran and should be wholly subordinated to the authentic sayings of Baha'u'llah. Uh, of course, it's understandable for a couple of reasons that we will get to when we study the Quran, but simply stated, it's more recent by a more recent manifestation. And as we will find out uh, in this passage here, it constitutes the only book which can be regarded as an absolutely authenticated repository of the Word of God. And so uh, Shoghi Effendi in this letter says that the Baha'i scholars must strive to obtain from sources that are authoritative and unbiased a sound knowledge of the history and tenets of Islam, the source and background of their faith and approach reverently and with a mind purged from preconceived ideas the study of the Quran, which apart from the sacred scriptures of the Babi and Baha'i revelation, so forth, is the only authenticated repository. And one other thing very important in this, uh, about this same quote, and that is that uh, uh, what we also need to do is uh, according to Shoghi Effendi, is redeem Islam in the Western world. And by that, it doesn't necessarily mean to redeem it as it is, but to redeem it for, I would infer, the Muslim world as well. That's one of the amazing things, and it's something I've often thought about. Uh, because so much of the Book of Certitude, almost every page you will see at the bottom a note referring to a passage from the Quran. So uh, remember that Baha'u'llah's primary audience were Muslims. And so he is in effect proving to them the mean, or explaining to them the meaning of their own scripture. So did the Bab. So much of the Bab's work is illuminating or elucidating uh, and explicating the surah of the Quran. Of course, the first and in some ways the most important work he wrote, the Qayyum al Asma, is an explication of the Surah of Joseph. Uh, here are some examples where there's conflict Isaac versus Ishmael. In the Bible, uh, Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac. In the Quran, it's Ishmael. And that's important because as we, uh, Ishmael, of course, in the Bible uh, is expelled uh, and uh, th this has nothing to do with his being sacrificed, but he is the firstborn and it is he whom Abraham is willing to sacrifice. And Ishmael is a very important figure in the succeeding religions because it is from him that you have the descending uh, lineal descendants of Saleh and Hud and uh, uh, Mohammed uh, and the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Uh, there's a lovely book out uh, that I'm sure many of you have read, uh, written by a Baha'i called Abraham, uh, Two Wives, five, uh, what, how does it go? I forget the title of it, Two Wives, Five Religions, and uh, something like that. But it's, uh, I've read it, it's, it's, it's delightfully done. The missing manifestations, Saleh and Hud, who are discussed both in the Quran and in the Book of Certitude. Not in great detail, but the same thing happened to them that happened to Noah. Um, you also have, and I didn't put this, a totally different story of Adam who is a manifestation in the Quran. 
uh, and he's not involved in the creation myth at all. Um, the stories of Abraham, Moses, and Joseph, which are told in very complete form in the Quran, uh, are more reliable than what we have in the Old Testament. The clarification of the station of Christ in regard to the Trinitarian doctrine is uh, uh, really implicit in the New Testament. It is only put together by the Christian scholars uh, around the fifth century of the Christian religion at the Council of Nicaea. And uh, it uh, becomes doctrine that Christ was God incarnate which of course, from a Baha'i point of view, is blasphemous. <laughs> and uh, it ultimately resulted in the, among other things, the destruction of Christianity, that doctrine. And the concept of progressive revelation itself uh, is told in the Quran. It's hinted at the succession. You have the genealogies and so on in the Old Testament. Christ, of course, is descended <clears throat> from David and, and so on. You have the genealogies that are spelled out. You can look in the uh, online and get the genealogies of, of these. But the concept of progressive revelation as such is first told in complete form by Mohammed in the Quran. And that's why the Book of Certitude by Baha'u'llah starts out by summarizing the Surah of Hud which is a surah that describes very fully uh, an allusion to the succession of prophets and most importantly, how they were all rejected by the followers of the previous revelation. A nice irony. The unreliability of miracles. Um, While sometimes the basis for belief in manifestations, this sort of proof is disparaged in two ways in the Baha'i teachings. Usually they have a symbolic, not a literal meaning. Uh, Baha'u'llah even goes so far in the, uh, the, son of the uh, epistle to the son of the wolf to say this, we entreat our loved ones not to be smirched the hem of our raiment with the dust of falsehood, neither to allow references to what they have regarded as miracles and prodigies to debase our rank and station, or to mar the purity and sanctity of our name. This doesn't mean he didn't perform miracles. He's just saying that's not a basis for belief. Uh, and uh, if you um, uh, don't use it as a basis for teaching the faith. Abdu baha gives a more logical, uh, not more logical, but another explanation uh, he says, almost most uh, of the miracles of the prophets which are mentioned have an inner significance. Now, he, he goes on to say, it, maybe some of these things happened, but a lot of them did not. They are, they, they are spiritual in nature. And he goes on to say, for instance, in the gospel, it is written that at the martyrdom of Christ, darkness prevailed and the earth quaked and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the dead came forth from their graves. Well, he says, literally, if, if these events had happened, they would indeed have been awesome and would have certainly been recorded in the history of the times. Our purpose is not to deny such miracles. Our only meaning is that they do not constitute decisive proofs and that they have an inner significance, that their main, main importance is spiritual. I'm not going to read all of this, uh, but uh, he does say that uh, he doesn't wish, this is Abdul Baha, uh, Some Answered Questions, page 37. That's the old uh, version of Some Answered Questions different page in the new one. I do not wish to mention the miracles of Baha'u'llah, for it may perhaps be said that these are traditions liable both to truth and to error, like the accounts of the miracles of Christ and the gospel, which come to us from the apostles and not from anyone else and are denied by the Jews. Though if I wish to mention the supernatural acts of Baha'u'llah, they are numerous. They are acknowledged in the Orient and even by some non-Baha'is. But he goes on to say, these aren't proofs. He says, uh, 
Uh, look at the last paragraph. Consequently, these accounts are not satisfactory proofs. Yes, miracles are proofs for the eyewitness only. And even he may regard them not as a miracle, but as an enchantment. Extraordinary feats have also been related uh, of some or by some conjurers. Finally, what is a personal God? And in other words, this is something else we want to be aware of as we go through the, the five religions in the next 10 classes. What is their concept of God? Because they don't all have or, or imply the same God or the same concept of God. And so we've talked about this before, but I want to read this again because it's so important. Uh, what do we mean by a personal God? Because uh, uh, as you'll see at the end of this quote by Shoghi Effendi, to say that God is a personal reality does not mean he has a physical form. So we don't mean that God is made, made in the image of man, but rather we are in the image of God, and even that is spiritual, not physical. What is meant by personal God is a God who is conscious of his creation, who has a mind, a will, a purpose, in other words, a being, and not, as many scientists and materialists believe, an unconscious and determined force operating in the universe. Such conception of the divine being as the supreme and ever-present reality in the world is not anthropomorphic, meaning not human-like, for it transcends all human limitations and forms and does by no means attempt to define the essence of divinity, which is obviously beyond any human comprehension. So, to prepare for your next class, uh, I'm going to give you uh, on the same place on my website where you downloaded the quiz, uh, I'm going to uh, include in that now a clue to each of the questions on the quiz because I've had some very nice responses and explanations for the questions, but no one yet has gotten all of them right. And there's about one word that will clue you in to what the Baha'i view on these questions is about. Uh, any rate, as you be prepare for the uh, next class, keep in mind that God is a, uh, a God of logic and love. These two qualities, uh, the logic, never forget that everything God does has a purpose and that it is our job to try to discern what that logic is, whether it's his laws, uh, or his teachings on any other aspect of theology. So if you look at the, the, the book of laws, the Kitabi uh, Agdas, the, the most holy book, and you see a law and you think, that sounds strange. Uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with it, uh, but, but I know I have to because it's from God. <laughs> but there is a logic to it. See if you can discover what it is. It's a lot of fun. A lot of them, of course, depend on a society that is yet to be born, uh, and they would not be operant or even feasible or even good right now. The changeless spiritual law, and I'm not going to read this either, but suffice to say this is something we've talked about before, and that is there are two types of law that the manifestations bring. One is the spiritual law, which does not change. Uh, notice uh, he says the, that each of them, he says this, oops, excuse me, here, well, I can't do it. This does not change or alter the spiritual law. What was spiritual a thousand years ago is spiritual today. The ways of implementing them do, do change. These divine qualities, these eternal commandments will never be abolished. But the social law evolves. The second part of the religion of God, which refers to the material world and which comprises fasting, prayer, forms of worship, marriage, divorce, the abolition of slavery, legal processes, transactions, indemnities for murder, violence, theft, and injuries. This part of the law of God, which refers to material things, is modified and altered 
and each prophetic cycle in accordance with the necessities of the times. And I, that's page 47 and some answered questions, again, the old edition. Uh, not because I prefer it, I simply didn't have time to uh, find it in the new one. I had time, but I, I didn't do it. Here's, here's something that uh, you may want to do. It's a wonderful what you have at your fingertips with your computer. This is just something I pulled from uh, going on Google and saying, uh, show me a chart that shows me the structure of the Old Testament, because there are 49 books in this thing. Uh, and this is so helpful because it shows, the, of course, the part that was revealed by Moses, uh, and it shows how they're set off, the prophets, the writings, the other, the other parts, and so on. Uh, chronologies are so helpful. This is a chronology that each one is a hot link. That you can go, well, the flood, uh, I can click on that, and it will go to uh, an online site that will tell me about the flood. And there it is right. Well, if I had a, uh, there it is, okay, the flood. And all of these things, the year Shelah was born, so on. So at any rate, uh, uh, going to the chronology uh, uh, of the Old Testament uh, begins uh, Adam to the flood, so on. So that these, there are all sorts of helpful things you can do in studying Judaism. And so, with this beautiful, beautiful picture of the uh, walk to the door, and, and, and let me stop sharing, take a breath, and we'll have a, about 10 or 15.